Hello, I'm Zachary Kleindienst, the Assistant Pastor at New Life Austin. I'm also a licensed professional counselor and a member of the Center for Apostolic Counseling. And today we're going to be spending a little bit of time in this session discussing the topic of establishing healthy ministry habits. Establishing healthy ministry habits. And so our, our goal for this session, what we're going to talk about is practical ways that we can seek to live out, um, one, the, the call of God on each of our lives and in our ministries, but how we can do so from an intentional uh, way with practical, concrete steps uh, to live out that call with fruitfulness and with longevity. Um, you may be familiar with the role of the parson, but in uh, specifically in early um, American history, um, among Puritan practices, for example, in the late 16th, 17th centuries, and so forth, we we read about the parson in um, Puritan practices. The the parson, in in many ways, was like your um, kind of typical parish pastor. He um, would minister throughout the week, and he would attend to the needs of a household or of a family. But one of the unique things that the, the parson did that I think is um, helpful or informative in our conversation today is the parson would go and would meet with, throughout the week, would meet with the head of each home, um, perhaps a husband or a, a father and a mother, of each household within his parish. And what the parson would do is he would seek to sit down with them and he would conduct a bit of an interview and he would find out, you know, what do they do for work? Maybe uh, this family um, had dairy cow or maybe another family um, harvested grain or fruit trees. And so he would sit down with them and he would interview and he would seek to find out about their their kind of rhythms throughout their home. How many children did they have? What were the ages of their children? Were, um, were, were their children um, educated at home, um, maybe by uh, the mother or by an older sibling? Or did they, um, were they educated maybe outside the home, going to a schoolhouse or something of that nature? And what the parson would seek to do in these efforts is begin to kind of wrap his mind around the daily structure, rhythms, the habits of this home. And so after the parson had kind of conducted this interview, he would then begin to make practical, concrete recommendations about how the parents in this home could begin to um, orchestrate or order the, the daily rhythms of their home in ways that promoted spiritual formation. Um, if they woke up early, then maybe they could do um, just some, some time of maybe prayer before going out onto the farm. Um, if they uh, worked late into the evening, but if they came all together for lunch in the middle of the afternoon, then maybe in those times they could maybe sing a song together or worship or um, spend time together reflecting and maybe meditating on the promises of the Lord. What the parson sought to do was to take this sometimes nebulous, abstract idea of spiritual formation, of the Christian disciplines and discipleship, and he would sit down with average people like you and like me, and he would try to make spiritual formation, he would try to make theology contextual, would seek to do in some way, make something that could be lived out day by day by these average people in their home with their children. For the sake of our conversation today, I'd like for us to use the parson uh, as a bit of, uh, a, a, of an example of the conversation we are going to have. And I would invite you in your own life, in your home, uh, with maybe with your spouse or the children that you have, to maybe imagine what would it be like if you were to sit down with a parson today. If there were to be a parson that were to come and sit down at your kitchen table or your dining room table, and if they were to interview you and look at what your weekly schedule looks like and the rhythms of your home and your daily practices and habits, what would, 
that look like? Now, some of this has actually been informed by even earlier Christian practices. Uh, Saint Benedict, for example, had kind of the Benedictine order and uh, established a rule of life that he referred to it as. And what the rule of life was, he had these rules, um, which really were, were more, he would end up kind of using the word rhythm or habits interchangeably. And he used these rules that, that he likened to being a trellis. And that, as he describes in some of his writings, if you have a series of vines that are growing beside a home or are growing maybe alongside a tree or something, and you want them to grow in a specific path, if you want these vines to follow a specific pattern along this home, then you would install a trellis. And what the trellis, of course, would do is it would, it would provide a, a, a concrete framework that these vines that don't have maybe the strength of an oak tree or a sequoia tree, it would provide the strength, the backbone for a vine to reach potential that it can achieve, but giving it concrete means of doing so. And so Benedict used the idea of a trellis when he looked at the spiritual life and how are each of us growing more in the image of God. And his idea with that was to develop what he would refer to as the rule of life. And these were daily practices, daily habits that he would seek to engage in with times of prayer and worship and devotion and these very practical, very detailed um, um, practices in order to live out what God was doing in his life. And so again, as that relates to us today, I would encourage you to reflect on some of this as we kind of dive into our topic uh, to talk about what are practical, realistic um, habits, practices that I can seek to live out in a place in my life as I seek to uh, live out the fullness of the call of God on my life. So as we seek to do this today, um, I would like to begin by providing some definition. That way we're kind of on the same page when we're using terms that we'll kind of define real quick what some of these terms mean. First, I want to talk about what we mean when we, when we use the word healthy. Um, when I use the, the word healthy, what I'm really referring to are practices, uh, habits, um, daily behaviors, or uh, specific disciplines, one that are effective, um, that seek to um, in some way instill whether physical health or spiritual health, um, that seek to live out the fullness of the call of God in a very practical way. Um, but also, I, I, I view the, the term healthy as something that's bearing fruit. And so that may be spiritual fruit in each of our lives. Uh, we could also look at that as being maybe fruit within our ministries or our churches or what God is doing through us. And so we're also then understanding that these practices are, are healthy in that they are producing good fruit. Finally, when I use the word healthy, I also think of longevity. Ultimately, when we're looking at ministry, we're, we're looking at ministry kind of for the long haul, and we'll talk about this in a second. But I'm looking at practices that are healthy in that they are sustainable and that they are helping each of us to ha live out a full sense of longevity in ministry. Second, when we use the word ministry, um, for the sake of this session and this conversation, um, I'm kind of focusing my um, notes and my kind of thought process to ministers, uh, maybe to pastors or to staffs of, of a church, maybe to evangelists or missionaries or those who are actively involved, whether in full-time or part-time, in some way of doing ministry. Now, of course, these, many of these principles can be generalized to um, perhaps any type of individual, but for the sake of this conversation, I use ministry intentionally because, and we're, we'll talk about this in a second, because ministry, we understand, comes with kind of unique challenges and um, unique burdens and blessings. And so the focus of uh, what I'd like to talk about today really focuses on ministry. Finally, habits. Now, 
for the sake of, uh, of my kind of wrestling with the term habit, um, what we'll be talking more about is using this idea of habit from the perspective of intentional practices rather than using the idea of habit of how maybe sometimes we think about it of maybe kind of mindless behaviors or just kind of rote practices that we do without thinking about that we wake up and make coffee or brush our teeth or drive to work and don't know how many you know stop signs we drive through no really when i think of of habits in this context i'm focusing on the idea of these are intentional practices that I'm seeking to live out in my life and in my ministry, in my home, with my children, with, with my wife, with, with those around me, what are these um, practices, these habits that we can use? Um, another way of, of looking at this in a term that I also like to use kind of interchangeably with habits is rhythms. These, these kind of ebbs and flows of our spiritual life, our spiritual practices. And so I'll commonly maybe use the, the, the term practices or habits or rhythms interchangeably because to me they kind of mean the same, these intentional efforts that we're seeking to live out. And so kind of diving into our conversation, the first question I'd like for us to um, kind of think about together is why should we establish healthy habits, healthy ministry habits. Well, I think that the, the first part of this, as I mentioned earlier, is that I believe that God has called each of us to ministry. And a part of that calling comes with, I believe, a sense of longevity. If God has called you to be a minister, if God has called you to be a pastor or a missionary or an evangelist or whatever place you may be in ministry, I believe that that is for the longevity of your ability, so to speak, to function in ministry. That the, the, the practices that we seek to engage in, the habits, I believe, should seek to enforce that and live that out in the fullness of what we can achieve. And so I think that the reason why we should talk about establishing healthy ministry habits is to say how are we seeking to live our lives in a way that is promoting longevity in ministry for the long term. Also, we understand that we kind of are living in a time where there's high stress. There's kind of a lot going on in the world that we live in around us. Um, from the, the economy and, and, and wars and COVID and all kinds of stuff, there's a lot going on in our world. And so there, that stress that maybe we experience on an individual level, but we also understand the stress that maybe we see in our congregations and maybe the, the, the churches that we minister at. We understand, of course, that we are living in a time where there is high stress. We know that there are also, of course, many obstacles that we face in this life. There are burdens and concerns that you and I may face or that members of our congregation, those that we minister to, may face. And so there are unique challenges that ministry uh, presents. Um, you, you know, uh, for example, maybe not having a clearly defined nine to five role and, you know, maybe getting phone calls in the middle of the night or um, struggling with, with time off or struggling with, with specific patterns of our schedule can present unique challenges. And so with this, when we're talking then about establishing healthy ministry habits, we're saying, how are we intentional with that? Do, again, doing the work of the parson. How am I, one, recognizing some of these obstacles, some of these challenges, but then seeking to say, what can I do knowing that these are some of the obstacles that I face? Also, you know, I don't feel like I need to cite a lot of, you know, statistics here to know that ministry brings stress and brings concerns and, and all that that maybe you and I face. Uh, there are a plethora of data that has been, especially recently in light of COVID-19, that has been done to talk about the challenges that pastors are facing, the concerns, the high levels of stress and anxiety, and, and the struggles that pastors and those in their families and those on church staffs are facing. And so I believe that this then presents the need for conversations like this. How are we being aware of the, of the complexity of the times that we are living in to seek to live out the fullness of the call of God, ultimately to produce good fruit for the kingdom of God. With this, something else briefly before we move on to our next point is 
social media and the the connectedness of the world around us, I believe, has also um, created a lot of interesting challenges regarding our expectations of ministry. What does ministry look like, and how do I how do I know if I'm doing a good job? If that makes sense, or 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 we're whatever we're what we're seeing, you know, maybe a, a, another church, whether it's in our community or somewhere else, and we're seeing how good of a presentation they have or their music, or whatever. And what this does is is maybe expectations that we place on ourselves. It can create a sense of expectations of those within our congregation as they come to worship on Sunday or Wednesday. And so social media and and the, the connectedness of the internet and the world around us has certainly added to a high level of stress, of concern, of awareness in ministry that I think is important for us to, to be intentional about, of knowing how that impacts our own perception of the work that we are doing for the kingdom of God. This then kind of bridges right into the reality that success in ministry can be pretty ambiguous. Um, what does it mean to be a successful pastor or a successful evangelist or a successful ministry? What does that look like? I think that many times in our efforts to try to uh, describe this maybe within our own minds, we tend to fall back on kind of those concrete, quantifiable metrics. Uh, maybe it's whatever, the average person that's attending our, our worship service, or maybe it is um, the, the number of people who are baptized or receive the Spirit on a given weekend. And we tend to kind of fall back on some of these quantifiable metrics because they're, they're visual and they're attainable. Now, this isn't to say that those aren't helpful and they're very helpful for us to um, be able to, to measure where we're at. But ultimately, these are, are measures of past data and don't necessarily predict or tell us where we truly are. And so when we then are working to, to, to provide a helpful uh, description of what a successful ministry look like, sometimes this is where we can kind of fall in, in, in maybe a, a, a pitfall within our own selves of comparing ourselves to other ministers or to other pastors or other churches. There are many areas of this that we don't have time to dive into today, but it's helpful for us to be aware of how am I measuring my own sense of success or achievement or my own sense of value or worth within the ministry. Because whether or not we're intentional, we're aware about it, we're to some level all doing that. And so being mindful and knowing that helps us to see what is the impact that this is having on my own ability to live out the fullness of the call of God. So diving into our, our, our next point, uh, we could ask, what insight then does Scripture provide on this topic as we're talking about establishing healthy ministry uh, habits? I think that one of the, the main ways that perhaps we could lean on this is kind of using that idea of rhythm. When we look at Scripture, uh, for example, we start at the beginning in Genesis and we find that God creates the heavens and the earth and we move through the days of creation and we, we have this very intentional, structured um, form, this order that God ordains from the beginning and that God creates light and that God moves on and He's giving form and definition and He's, he's dividing the, 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 the oceans and, and, and the dry land and He's filling the land with, with creatures and animals and He's filling the oceans and the air with birds and with, with fish and whale. And so what we find is this very progressive sense of structured order in creation. God is very systematic, so to speak, in what He's doing in creation. There is an order, there is a rhythm, so to speak, that we see in creation. There is day and there is night, there are tides, there are seasons, there, as we jump forward real quick to Ecclesiastes, we see that there are seasons, there are times of being born and times of dying, times to laugh and times to mourn. What we know is that the human experience, the human life, is one that comes with a sense of metronome, a sense of rhythm that we see throughout our lives. As we jump to the Levitical calendar, for example, 
We know that there was a morning, there was an evening sacrifice. We know that there were three times a year specific feasts when the people of Israel would gather together to, to worship together. We know that there was this very um, organized, rhythmic schedule to worship. Again, there was the morning and the evening sacrifice. There were these seasons throughout the year and times when the whole community of faith as being Israelite would assemble together and they would go into the temple of the Lord to worship and present themselves before God. We look to the ministry of Jesus and we see that there were times when he had compassion on the multitudes and times when he would retreat into the mountain. He would go there and pray alone by himself. We you find, for example, if you even look at the way that Jesus orders his time, we see that the, uh, roughly 70% of his time is spent with those right closest and nearest to him, those who were kind of most trainable, those who uh, the disciples and those closest to him. We find that he spends the least amount of time, less than 5%, with those who really were highly draining and combative, and we see the Pharisees and Sadducees, for example, and those who were, were seeking to eventually uh, uh, crucify him. And so even Jesus' ministry gives us this sense of rhythm in, in time and structure and a sense of intentional effort of what he's doing. One more example, we look at uh, the book of Acts and we see uh, the, the Hellenistic widows who are, there's this contention that's coming up. And so the, the uh, apostles and they, they gather together and they're saying, hey, listen, this is what we need to do. The, the, the church is growing quickly. Some scholars are saying up to 10,000 people. They are, are trying to minister to the needs, but they can't. And so they're saying, who can we get to do this job so that we can devote ourselves to praying, to fasting, to ministering the word of the Lord. They knew that in order to be effective and to be fruitful, there had to be some sense of how can we delegate tasks that we can't do or delegate tasks that, that, that we may still be able to do so that we can spend our time better, facilita better facilitating in areas that maybe only we can do. So let's jump down but before we conclude today and talk about some practical steps of how do we establish healthy ministry habits. I like to look at this topic from the perspective of capacity. If you look at a cup or if you look at um, a, a, a tea pitcher or a gallon of milk, each has their own ability of capacity. They can only hold so much. The human body, the, the, the human psyche and who we are as being finite fallen creatures, we have a sense of capacity. There's only so much that our bodies and our, our minds, our emotions can, can take. And so seeking to gauge our capacity is really important in this conversation of establishing healthy ministry habits. First, we seek to, dis to discern what is our capacity. For some, maybe th their physical capacity is, is much greater and they can sleep only a couple hours a night and they can, they can handle much greater levels of stress and so forth. For others, maybe not so much and maybe you require more sleep and maybe um, you're, you, you experience more kind of somatic or, or physical symptoms to high levels of stress and, and, and all. That's important to know of saying how am I building the, the habits, the rhythms, the practices of my life and being intentional about the capacity that I have. So I want to talk about this in a couple of areas. First, our physical capacity. As I mentioned, each of us has those kind of physical limitations, those physical capacities of what we can endure, whether it being sleep, whether it being our, our stress level that we carry, whether it being um, even just the, the very physical um, practices of our health and our exercise level of our diet. These are, are some of those practical steps that we can look at and begin to measure, saying, how am I taking care of my physical body? How are, are you getting enough sleep every night? Are you eating a healthy diet? Are you managing stress in a healthy manner? Are you um, exercising and, and seeking to, to live out habits or rhythms or practices that are healthy, that are helpful, ultimately for you as they pertain to ministry? Um, you know, we may kind of neglect the conversation of physical health, but it's an important part of being able to physically, <laughs> actively, convey the gospel. 
Second one that I want to uh, mention here is emotional capacity. Um, just like within our physical bodies, we carry um, emotional stress and worries, anxieties, fears. We um, seeking maybe as a pastor or a member of staff within a church, there are those within a local church body that tend to kind of dump a lot of that on us and they bring their, their, their struggles and their pains, their worries to us. And so we carry some of that emotional weight with them. We then seek to say, how are we managing our emotional health? How are we managing the emotions that we feel? And how are we expressing them in healthy ways? Another one that kind of connects directly to this is our cognitive capacity, our thoughts. How are you managing your thought life and the worries and the stress that may kind of circle throughout your mind? How are you intentionally helpful uh, in a healthy manner managing those thoughts? And there are many ways that you can do this. Um, you can do so through writing, you can do so through um, listening to music or listening, uh, c connecting with peers. You can, you can manage your emotions and your thoughts by maybe leaning on a spouse or on a trusted uh, friend or on seeking to through prayer. Uh, you can do these in very practical manners to manage and understand that sense of capacity. Another, of course, important side is the spiritual facet of our capacity. Being able to spending times with prayer and fasting and looking at the Word of God. These are important parts that help to give richness, give depth, give security within, one, our ministry, but also us as individuals being formed in the image of Christ. Our own spiritual formation, our own spiritual discipleship is an active part of seeking to establish those healthy uh, ministry practices, those rhythms within our relationship with God. And so what does your daily or your weekly or your monthly seek, uh, sense of discipleship look like? What practices do you engage in? The final one here is our social connectedness, our social capacity. I was recently had an honor to uh, go out and, and minister in the Pacific Northwest and was with a, a, a pastor and we were hiking kind of near a ridge and he had pointed out some trees that were nearby that had fallen. And he told me that this was the result of uh, logging practices in the area where they would come through and they would harvest the old growth trees, the old trees that were in the area that had growth and deep roots. And what would happen is when the, these old growth was removed, this process known as thinning, that when the next storm would come through and, and high winds would blow through the area, the young trees didn't have the physical strength to maintain the storm. And so because the old trees had been thinned, the young trees would end up falling. And you can see whole hillsides, whole ridges where the trees had fallen. This is a, an apt metaphor for each of us as we look at the importance of peers, elders, pastors, friends in each of our lives, as we're seeking to gauge our capacity, as we're seeking to establish healthy ministry habits, as we're doing the work of the parson in our lives, it is often through friends, through active peers, mentors, and pastors that this can be done intentionally. And so as we conclude today, I would invite you Spend some time reflecting on each of these areas of capacity. Spend some time actively thinking about if I were to, to establish these healthy ministry practices in my life, if I were to establish healthy habits and rhythms, what would that look like? What can I practically do? I would invite you to spend some time contemplating that today. God bless.